Um, and this is going to be kind of high level and oversimplified. Uh, it's not possible even for just these two topics to really get down into all the nitty gritty in the time that we have. So uh, if there's anyone on the call or watching this later on YouTube who is very familiar with PostgreSQL, you're going to be like, but you're leaving things out. And that is true. Um, so um, the two topics that I picked out to talk about today are joint planning and statistics. And we're going to start about with joint planning, which I think will be a little bit more than half of the talk. And then statistics will be the second part, which will be a little bit less than half of the talk. Um, and so the first question about joint planning is, you know, why is that interesting? Why are you talking about that? And I have three reasons. So the first one is that joint planning has a big impact on query performance to the extent that, you know, if you get a good plan for the joints that are involved in your query, you're probably going to be reasonably happy with the performance of your query. Uh, if you get a bad plan for the joints that are in your query, the query is probably going to be so slow that you're going to be complaining. Um, that's not always the case. Sometimes you get a bad join plan and you still survive. Sometimes you get a good join plan and it's still bad. Uh, but it's a pretty good indicator. Uh, it, it's, uh, it makes a big difference. Uh, the second reason for talking about this topic is that join planning is complicated and expensive. Uh, the number of possibilities that need to be considered grows astonishingly quickly as the number of tables being joined increases. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. Um, but this is a you know a big consumer of CPU during query planning. Uh, and the third reason is that joins are really common. Uh, a lot of queries use joins, and a lot of queries that use joins use many joins. It's not particularly uncommon to see a query with 20 or more joins in it, uh, whereas it is pretty uncommon to see a query with you know, 20 group by clauses or something like that, or 20 limits. I mean, it can certainly be done, uh, and people do, but joins, it happens a lot more. So why does the number of possibilities that need to be considered grow so quickly? Well, um, I got a query on the slide here that I think illustrates the point pretty well. Uh, I've got n tables with very creative names. And they all have an ID column, which has the same meaning in every table. So it's sensible to just say that all of the ID columns are equal to each other and join all the tables. How many ways can we join all of these tables? Well, I think it's pretty easy to see that there have got to be at least n factorial possibilities here because we can pick any one of our n tables and use that as the driving table. And then we can join it to any one of the n minus one remaining tables and then join that to any one of the tables we still have left and so on until we get down to the last one. So that's n factorial possible join orders. But that's actually an underestimate because it doesn't consider what a comment in the source code calls bushy plans. Uh, because we could, for example, join A1 to A2 and then separately join A3 to A4 and then join the results of those joins to each other. Um, and that's not considered in any of those n factorial possibilities because in, in those n factorial possibilities, we're joining the tables in one by one, but here they're coming in in a clump, two at a time, or more than two potentially. Uh, I looked around on the internet for a formula for what the actual you know, correct equation was for the number of join orders that had tables, uh, and I couldn't find one that I was totally convinced was correct. So somebody probably knows what the real the, uh, equation the textbook is. Says it's, it, the textbook says it's the Catalan number. It's like four to the n. Hmm. Okay, could be. Yeah. Um, but uh, all what I know for sure is it grows faster than in factorial. So that's already a, a very fast growing thing. Uh, and that's just for the number of join orders. So then for each possible join order, um, we have n minus one joins that are going to happen. And each one could be a nested loop or a merge join or a hash join. So that's three to the n minus one possibilities. So it's exponential. Uh, three is actually kind of an underestimate because there's three basic algorithms, sure, um, but each one of them has multiple variants. So actually uh, it's not really a constant exponent, but uh, if it were, uh, if you imagine that it were, the, the base would be larger than three. So when you put all of that together, you've got you know, something that grows faster than a factorial multiplied by an exponential, it's a really large number of possible ways that you can join n tables together. Um, so faced with that complexity, you sort of have two options. 
One is that you could try to give up on some of the possibilities without even thinking about them, try to figure out which things are less promising and just don't even consider those. And the other thing that you could do is try to explore the entire search space as efficiently as you can, given how big it is. And PostgreSQL mostly opts for the latter approach. There are some corner cases, which I think are not interesting enough to spend time on in this presentation, where we don't consider certain possibilities, but by and large, what the planner is trying to do is as an exhaustive search. So uh, we need to just make sure that we do that as efficiently as you can for a problem of this size. Um, and the basic strategy is to avoid recomputation. So if you think about two possible join orders, say A1, A2, A3, A4, or on the other hand, A1, A2, A4, A3, they, they both start by joining A1 to A2. So we hope that when we study that problem, the problem specifically of joining A1 and A2, we hope that when we solve that problem the first time, we wouldn't use an algorithm where we would need to then figure out uh, whatever we've learned a second time when we studied the other join order because they're closely related. Uh, so PostgreSQL uses a bottom up sort of dynamic programming strategy here to uh, avoid that kind of recomputation. And basically the idea is we're gonna consider every subset of the tables that are named in the query. So if we've got N tables in the query, there are two to the N subsets of those tables. The empty set isn't interesting, but we're gonna consider all of the other subsets. And we're going to do so starting with the subsets of lowest cardinality. So that basically means we're gonna start with the tables, right? Because if we have six tables, for example, there are 63 subsets of six items six of those have cardinality one, and, and those are the six subsets that contain exactly one table. So we're gonna first consider each one of those tables. Then we're gonna look at the subsets of size two, which correspond to the 15 possible two-way joins. And then there's gonna be 20 possible three-way joins and 15 possible four-way joins and so on until finally, when we get to considering the one possible six join, we're actually six-way join, we're actually considering the, the original problem that we started out to solve, which is how to join all six of those tables together. Um, as we consider uh, each of these uh, tables first and then each of these joins, we're gonna make a list of potential strategies for solving that part of the problem. And it's important to recognize uh, that, you know, we're not actually gonna use all of these joins, right? Like we, we have 20 possible three-way joins that we could do, but whatever final plan we come up with can involve at most two of those uh, and usually only one because it could involve two if we join three tables and then join the other three tables and then join the results of those two together. But typically that's that's not gonna be what happens. So we're only gonna use one or two of those three-way joins, for example, but we don't know which one. So we're gonna consider all 20 uh, to get there. So in this example, uh, we have six tables or what the planner calls base relations and then 57 possible joins, what the planner calls join relations for a total of 63 relations. And we're gonna make a list of potentially interesting approaches for each one. So this is not an efficient algorithm because we have an exponential number of things, uh, an exponential number of relations, and we're doing a very much non-constant amount of work for each one. Uh, we're gonna consider lots and lots of possibilities for each one of those relations, especially the joins that are higher up in the tree, uh, throw away the possibilities that look clearly inferior and then keep the rest. So this still does not scale to large join problems uh, because we are searching this fast search space. Uh, so at some point the algorithm breaks down and there's a parameter called gecko threshold that controls when we switch to an alternative algorithm. Uh, the default is 12, which I think is kind of low. Um, in almost all cases, you can go considerably higher than 12, but at some point it, it's just gonna get too slow uh, to do planning the regular way. So then we'll switch to something called the genetic query optimizer which has a genetic component, but the genetic component doesn't really work. Basically what it does is it tries a bunch of join orders at random and picks the best one. Uh, it will consider all of the possible join strategies for each of the join orders that it selects, but it's just gonna consider a very tiny number of possible join orders. So hopefully uh, one of those will be okay. Uh, some queries that's very likely to happen because in, in certain query shapes, there's a lot of join orders where they're all kind of the same. And, and so you're likely to hit one of them 
if you just choose some at random. But in other query shapes, uh, you know, there may be only a few join orders that are any good, and you may happen not to get one, and then you may get a very bad plan. So you you said that the like in for the genetic algorithm, like it sounds like the the cross breeding portion doesn't work, and so for it's almost just a random walk. Yeah, I mean it. There's code for it. Uh, my understanding from people who have played around with it is that the plans don't really improve when it goes through the genetic phase, or they don't improve okay. very much. So the quality of the final plan seems to be mostly a function of how good a job the random number generator does picking the initial population. Interesting, okay, thanks. So we're making a list of strategies for each relation. Which strategy sh should we keep? Uh, let's look at this uh, query that I've got here on the slide. Select star from food, join bar on foo.x equals bar.x or foo.y equals one. And consider this query from the point of view of relation foo. How should we get the rows that we need out of foo? Well, I think for most human beings looking at this query, your eye goes to the where clause. You see that foo.y is equal to one and you say we should use an index on foo.y, which does indeed have a very good chance of being the most promising approach, assuming that such an index exists. But not necessarily, because it could be the case that nearly all of the rows in the relation have y equals one. Um, and if that is the case, uh, then going through the index is going to be really expensive, like not just a little bit worse, but like a lot worse. Doing a, a full index scan of a table when you could have done, just done a sequential scan uh, is really bad. Um, so if, if rows with y equals one are uh, very prevalent, then we want to forget about the index and just sequential scan the table. The nice thing about those two strategies, which are here listed as A and B, is that they are easy to compare. Uh, as long as we know how common rows with y equals one are, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the second part of the talk, uh, we should be fine. We can compare the costs of those two strategies and we'll probably get the right answer. But there's some other strategies that are very difficult to compare, basically impossible to compare at this stage. And I've listed those here as C and D. So in strategy C, uh, we forget about the index on Y, we forget about the sequential scan, and we say, hey, maybe there's an index on foo.x that we could scan and we could just filter for rows where Y equals one. And that's going to be slower than whichever of A and B is faster, but it might avoid a sort down the road because we could decide on a merge join between foo and bar. And if we do, uh, and we don't use this strategy, then we're going to have to sort. Sorting could be expensive because there might be a lot of data. So we're going to need to keep strategy C, even though it's going to be more expensive. Uh, and we're also going to need to keep strategy D, where we're basically totally unable to make a cost estimate at this time. Strategy D is again using the index on foo.x, but now we're not scanning the whole index once. Now we're repeatedly scanning it each time looking for a particular value. So the way to imagine this is suppose we end up doing a nested loop join where bar is the driving table and then we're probing into foo for matches, um, which could be really, really good because it could be that bar is a very small table and foo is a very big table. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, that, that strategy might be a real winner. Um, but we can't estimate how expensive that is compared to A or B or C, because we don't know at this point how big bar is. So we don't know how many times we would have to do that repeated index probing, and we can't come up with any sort of meaningful estimate. So we'll have to hold on to this strategy as well, because uh, we, we can't tell. So that's the basic algorithm. Uh, and now I've got two slides here kind of talking about uh, what works well and more to the point, what doesn't work so well. Uh, the good point is that we can effectively postpone our decision-making. We can really effectively postpone our decision-making. If we've got a, a potential strategy or what the code calls a path, and we don't know whether it's better or worse than some other path, uh, we just keep them both, no problem. I mean, unless you're concerned about performance, then you might have a problem because the more paths you keep for the base relations, the more expensive your join planning is going to be at level two and at level three and at level four and at level five and however far up it goes. And uh, you know, similarly, if you have more ways in which one path can be worth keeping, 
then you'll probably not only end up with more paths for your base relations, you'll probably also end up with more paths for each join relation. So everything that makes you have uh, more ways to compare things and say that we don't know which one is better, the more expensive the whole things get, the whole thing gets. So when somebody comes along and they say, I want to make the planner do something new, if they just want to generate paths that will, in a particular case, either be better or worse than the paths we've already got, that's probably okay. I mean, assuming it's well implemented and they're not going too crazy with how many new paths there are, uh, it, it, it adds some cost, but it's probably not going to be a big deal. When people want to add new cost metrics, right, to say that something is better because it may avoid a sort or something is better because, uh, you know, it may facilitate a nested loop or because it's better because it may let us do parallel query later or, you know, it's better in some other way other than just being straight up cheaper, that kind of multiplies the planning cost through, through the whole process. So sometimes we can't do all the things that we want to do because it would just make planning too expensive. Um, the other sort of problem that I see here is that we're doing decision-making with very limited information. One of the big things that we don't know as we're working our way through the individual relations is how many rows are going to get produced at the end. So, you know, if we knew that your query was going to generate a billion rows, it would probably be sensible to just give up on the idea of doing parallel query straight off because the bottleneck is going to be how long it takes to send those billion rows to the client in virtually all cases. So to expend additional machine resources to generate those rows faster most likely makes no sense at all. But we have no idea. When we're thinking about the individual relations in the query, we, we have no knowledge of what the final row count is going to be. We don't even know yet what the row counts of the other relations that are involved in the query besides our own is. We, we only have this very local information about what's going on with a particular relation. We have a, you know, very slight pieces of visibility into other parts of the query, like you know, what join clauses are available. So which, which tables is this table being joined to? And we can you know, skip over generating things that aren't interesting because there are no join clauses, but that's like practically the only information that we have. So I, I, I don't know exactly how we would make use of more information that if we had it, but it does feel like, uh, you know, the postponing decision-making thing often forces us into making somewhat uneducated guesses about which strategies are worth pursuing at the early stages. And instead of skipping the work of generating them and saving everybody else the trouble, we have to generate them and then see what happens. So to be clear, like it's not, at, so the, 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 the process after is a, this multi-stage, multi-level thing, as you, as you call it. Um, and so at this first stage, we're just generating the paths. You don't do any in introspection to say, I have some histograms or sketches that say what I think the selectivity will be, and therefore I'm trying to guess what, what the output of a single operator or a single join will be. No, we do know oh. that. We do know that, okay. but only for our own relation. So like if I'm trying to estimate the join between foo and bar, I know how many rows are in foo, I know how many rows are in bar, I know how many of those rows are coming out given the filters that are in the where clause. Uh, I have an estimate of the join selectivity between foo and bar, right? But I only know about those two tables. If there's a third table Baz involved in the query, I, I don't have any idea what he's doing, except I know whether he's joined to either of my two tables. But I don't know how many rows are in that. I, I don't know whether there are four other tables involved in the query or 15. Like I only have facts. When I'm planning the join between foo and bar, I basically only have facts about those two tables and not anything else that, that may be happening. This is almost like an engineering thing that like sort of as you, as you like you're doing local optimization rather than having a global view of what's going on. Right. Yeah, yeah. okay, right. I understand. Yeah. So yeah. I wonder, uh, so sorry for a chime in, but I wonder whether there's an artifact that uh, Postgres is doing a bottom-up query planning so that you, Look for a local optimum for like a few number of relations first, and then you walk up. But on the other hand, if you use cascade, right? If you use a top-down uh, framework, then uh, maybe uh, you can know what are the like, stats of the entire query plan, even though you are only considering a subtree for now, because you will know what will happen, what might happen logically on the uh, other side of the tree. Does that make sense? I wonder. 
Yeah, I, I think that's right. I, I think, you know, it's been proposed on the mailing list uh, that maybe we should have more of a top down approach, which would obviously be a big change in terms of how much code would have to be revised. Um, but I think it could potentially help because then, uh, you know, if nobody ever asks, you don't have to generate the data. And if somebody does ask, then, uh, you, you know, you generate it and you cache it in case you get asked again. Mm -hmm. True. So the guy, Gertz Graffy, the guy that invented top down cascades, he made a sort of offhand comment at Sigmod one year that like, you should use top down for all their planning, but join ordering, you want to go bottom up. And the Germans at Hyper, the guys working at Hyper and Umbra, those guys are very adamant about bottom up is the way to go. Huh. You're the, yeah. I mean, so you're the first person. You're, you're the first person I've heard is like, yeah, top top down the, might be the right thing to do, when they already have a bottom up implementation. Well, the the interesting thing about it is like, if, if you've got a path like sequential scan the table, I, bottom up is fine, right? Yeah. Because every time you consider that table you're going to consider that path, right? Like if I, if table Z, okay, has a sequential scan path, I can use that when I think about how to join A to B, when I think about how to join B to Z, when I think about how to join the joint product of A and B together to Z, when I think about how to join C to Z, I'm going to get a lot of use out of that path because it's general, right? But what about strategy D here? repeatedly scanning an index on foo.x each time looking for a different value of x. That path is specific to when I'm trying to join something with bar in it to foo, right? Now, it doesn't have to be just bar. I mean, in this case, it does because there's only two tables in the query. But, but this kind of path on table foo could be used when joining bar directly to foo, or I could join bar to some other tables first and then join the result of that join to table foo afterward, and I could still use that path. But but this path is less reusable than, than these other paths, right? These other paths are 100% reusable. Th this path has diminished reusability because it's only reusable in certain contexts. Now, I, I don't quite see how going top down wins because I feel like I'm still gonna have to generate that path sometime. And if I've got to do it, I might as well do it in the bottom up flow what am I really gaining out of postponing it? I, I, it's not clear that I'm gaining anything at all, but it makes me uncomfortable. Like when I'm trying to write code to, to, to generate new paths, I'm like, gosh, you know, I don't, like, I don't really know whether this idea is any good, right? I, I can't, I can't tell, right? And so I, I don't have a specific proposal here. I just think there, there might be something to it. I mean, another idea that I've thought about is, doing one bottom-up pass where we just estimate row counts and don't do anything else. And then once we've got row counts for everything, go back and do a second pass where we generate paths. I feel like maybe there's something to that idea, right? Because then we'd have some information about how things were going to turn out in the end earlier before we actually generated all of the paths. And if knowing what the end result was going to be made you able to skip some of the intermediate work, that might be cool but I don't exactly see how it would let you skip anything either. So like, I have a feeling there's something we could be doing that is better than the thing that we are doing, but it's probably hard and even worse, I don't know what it is. Yeah, that's awesome, thank you. I have a quick, uh, a quick question. Uh, what uh, does the planner with uh, foreign tables currently in uh, terms of foreign data wrappers? Yeah, so if you're using a foreign data wrapper and you have a foreign table involved in the query, then basically the foreign data wrapper has to provide a callback uh, that that can do the same function that we would do for a native table. Um, so so it's basically up, up to the foreign data wrapper to provide a substitute implementation of that same functionality that we're talking about here. Okay, another, question from, another question from, from Andre. Uh, right. More of a so, yeah. So and Andre is talking about uh, something called uh, partial paths. Um, a, a partial path is something that I invented during the development of uh, parallel query. Um, and basically, a partial path represents something that if you if you executed the partial path within a single process, 
it would produce a subset of the results. So you, you execute a partial path in every one of your processes, and then you have to gather all of those partial results or gather merge all of those partial results uh, to, to produce the, the whole output of the parallel query. I don't really wanna get into that in this talk because that's one of the things where I mentioned at the beginning, like if you're a Postgres expert, you're gonna see that I'm leaving things out here and that's just, you know, so that we can cover some of the general principles and keep the time to something reasonable. So I don't really wanna, you know, dive down into that topic in this presentation, but, uh, you know, it, it, it is a very interesting question. I mean, I think what I would say in general is I actually would like to generate a lot more partial paths but I can't because of this problem that we just talked about that when you generate uh, more paths, it, it, it blows up the, the planning cost in a way that we really can't afford to do too much of. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a problem for sure. Um, okay, so uh, moving on, I'm gonna go to statistics now, if that's okay. I, I mean, absolutely, go for it, yes. Okay, cool. So uh, statistics, uh, we have this command called analyze and it gathers various pieces of statistical information. And basically what we're hoping to do with that statistical information is get accurate row count estimates. Um, we have a background process called auto vacuum. It actually does both automatic vacuum and also automatic analyze. Uh, so it will notice when tables have had a significant number of modifications since the last time they were analyzed. And when it notices that, it's like, oh, it's time to run analyze on that table. And it will do it for you in the background. Uh, so most of the time, you don't actually need to worry about it. Um, sometimes you do, but that, again, takes us outside the scope of this talk. Um, and, you know, the row count estimates are important to everything that we just talked about. So, you know, as we said before, if you've got something like select star from foo where a equals one, you need to know whether uh, rows with a equals one are really, really common. Because if they're really, really common, then you should probably forget about the index. Uh, if they're less common, then you probably want to make use of that index in some way. Um, here's a list of the statistics that Analyze gathers. Uh, these are all on a per column basis. So for every column, we're gonna estimate the fraction of rows where there's a null in that column. We're gonna estimate the average width of a non-null value stored in that column. We're gonna estimate how many different distinct, sorry, different distinct, how many distinct values appear in that column as you, as you go through the table. Um, this one is a problem because it's often not very accurate. It, it tends to cap out in the tens of thousands, no matter, how uh, large the table is. And that's because we don't want Analyze to run for an unreasonably long time. So we want it to sample a, a fixed size portion of the table. I mean, you can control exactly how much, but it doesn't scale as, as the table gets bigger. So we just don't have enough information to really know for sure how many dis distinct values there are in the column. Um, then we look at the values that appear in the column most frequently and uh, make an estimate of the frequency of each one. Um, and then we make a histogram uh, to give some idea of the distribution of values that are not MCVs. So we take all the... And then we divide the remaining ones up into like usually 100 buckets. So the lowest 1% of the sample values were between zero and 17 and the next 1% were between 17 and 51 or whatever it is. Um, then we make an estimate of physical to logical correlation. If your table has a lot of updates and deletes, this is likely to be zero. But if not, if you have like an insert only table uh, and it's like timestamp data so that the timestamp column is all, always going up, uh, then the correlation might be very close to one. Uh, if you have a column that's only inserted in descending order and you don't have a lot of updates and deletes, then the correlation might be very close to minus one. Um, and then if the column has an array type, then we'll actually peek inside the arrays and see uh, if we can make an estimate of what elements most commonly occur in your arrays and the estimated frequencies of them. Does it uh, peek into other data types as well, like trees so on, uh, <coughs> similar? No, I don't think so, but maybe you're about to tell me that the real answer is yes. Uh, I don't think so though. I wonder, uh, is there any discussion within Postgres uh, that to add 
the possibility to add any sketches uh, to the stats, like continuous sketch estimate uh, to give you a rough estimation of the selectivity of a particular value, things like that. Uh, I couldn't understand the word you were using. Sketch. So I wonder uh, whether uh, Postgres has internal discussion on adding uh, some types of sketches as a type of statistic. Sketches. I, I'm not sorry. I'm not familiar with the term. It, it, it's oh. like the, the, the hybrid log log uh, count min sketch. They're like approximate uh, data structures that uh, give you I like think. approximate counts, probabilistic data structures. Yeah. I, no. As far as I know, that idea has not been proposed. Um, I might have missed it, but I don't remember a discussion on that topic. Uh, we have used hyperlog log for a couple of other things, but not. We, no, I, I don't remember anyone proposing it for this purpose. We do keep the histograms as basically one type of sketch, but we haven't. Uh, we don't have anything more clever than that yet. The the, the the CEO of Splice Machine came and gave a talk at CMU a few years ago, and he was raving about how like the accuracy of their of their query, their cost model improved quite significantly when they switched from using like traditional histograms to, to like sketches. Okay. Um, so let's revisit this topic on a slide or two because I'm about to say some more things which are relevant to this to this topic. Um, so, um, you know, the question is like, uh, if we're gathering all of the statistical information and it looks like a decent amount of statistical information, uh, you know, does it work? Can we accurately estimate row counts? Um, back about 10 years ago now, uh, not long after I got started at Enterprise DB, I, I did a sort of informal survey of email threads on the PostgreSQL performance mailing list. I actually gave a talk based on that study at an old PGCon, if you want to look it up. Uh, but I went through like 168 email threads and sort of made my own tentative diagnosis of what I thought had happened, in my opinion. Um, and it looked to me like the big winner in terms of why those queries were slow was some kind of problem with the planner. I attributed 94 of them to that, to, to planner related causes. Um, I attributed 26 to unreasonable user expectations and or confusion, 23 to poor settings choices, uh, 14 to bugs either in the operating system or in PostgreSQL and 11 to deficiencies in Postgres outside of the query planner. You can see that 94 is a lot larger than all of those other numbers. Uh, and of those 94, I attributed 48 to row count estimation errors. Um, so the number one cause in this informal survey of queries being slow was the planner doing something bad. And the number one cause of the planner doing something bad was estimating the row count. Um, so this is not a solved problem. This is very much not a solved problem. Do you remember, do you remember when you did that survey whether you were the the cost model was overestimated or underestimated? Oh, both, both. Okay. Yeah, it, it, I, I mean, and and just as a sort of general piece of context, you, you know, if you get the row count wrong by a factor of two or three, it's not that big of a deal. The, the real problems come in and we'll see some examples of how this can happen in a minute when you're off by orders of magnitude, you know? And it's often a question of not what multiple were you off by, but how many of orders of magnitude was it? Like it can be six, right? When your row count estimate is off by six orders of magnitude, something bad is probably going to happen to your query plan. Uh, so yeah. Um, there are basically only three cases where we can effectively estimate the row count and uh, everything else is a mess. Uh, I'll talk about some of the messiness more in just a minute, um, but let's talk about the three cases that are pretty good. Uh, if you've got a simple equality condition like X equals 10, that's typically gonna be well handled. Uh, if 10 is an MCV, then we're gonna have a specific estimate for 10, um, which is likely to be fairly accurate. Uh, if not, then we don't really know how common 10 is, but we know it can't be that common and that's usually good enough. We do tend to be high more often than we're low because basically we're gonna say, well, you know, 70% uh, of the rows seem to have MCBs in them. And that means 
30% of the rows account for all of the non-MCBs, and we think there are 25,000 distinct values in the table. So take 30% divide by 25,000 and there, there's an estimate. Um, and that number may not be particularly correct for any non-MCV, but unless the table is really, really big, it's probably gonna be a relatively small number. And that's kind of what we need because we wanna know things like, yeah, you should use an index uh, if you've got one. Um, and as long as we get a relatively small number there, we don't tend to get ourselves into terribly bad trouble. Um, and then things like X is greater than 10. Uh, we know which MCVs are greater than 10 and we can use the histogram uh, to refine the estimate for the non-MCVs. In my experience, uh, even though this is not perfect, the, the number one problem is not algorithmic, but just if the table changes really fast and the new analyze hasn't run yet, uh, then it might be off. Since we've got a couple of PostgreSQL hackers on the call, I'm going to just mention the fact that there is some code uh, that is designed to correct for certain kinds of errors in this area uh, on the fly at runtime, but it does not work perfectly or cover all of the cases. So it's not a get out of jail free card. And you can have issues because Analyze hasn't run uh, frequently enough. It's not super common, but it happens. Um, and then the third case that we can uh, estimate pretty well is stuff like X is null or X is not null. Uh, that's directly one of the things that Analyze is measuring, so we're fine. Um, pretty much anything beyond that, uh, we've got issues. So my favorite example of this is the first query on this slide, select star from foo, where the quantity A plus zero is equal to A. The planner does not know what plus does. It certainly does not know that zero is the additive identity. So all you said is select star from foo where it has no, no clue what's going on there. So it's like, okay, default estimate, half a percent, which, you know, if there are no nulls, then this is always true. If there are nulls, then this is sometimes false, which is an easy to overlook point. But if there's no nulls, you know, you, your, your estimate is off by a factor of 200. Um, so that's that's the kind of order of magnitude problem that can set back query planning pretty significantly. Uh, and if you change it to A plus one equals A, then you still get the half a percent estimate because it still doesn't know anything about plus. And now you're off by however many orders of magnitude in the other direction because uh, the real answer is is zero, right? So that that case, th those kinds of cases suck. Uh, what's a lot more common than that in the real world is something like the, the second example on the slide here, select star from foo where A equals one and B equals two. Uh, in general, all we can do is hope that those two conditions are independent of each other, but they might not be independent of each other at all. Uh, it can very easily happen that rows where A equals one are super likely to also have B equals two or super unlikely to also have B equals two. Uh, and, and that can result in you being way off. I mean, it's particularly toxic if, you know, both A equals one and B equals two are relatively common individually. Let's say they both happen 10% of the time. So together, we're gonna say, okay, it's probably gonna happen 1% of the time. But the real answer might be 10, still 10%, in which case we're off by an order of magnitude in one direction, or it could be zero, in which case we're off by however many orders of magnitude in the other direction. Um, this particular case, we now have a nice tool that often helps a lot. You can run a create statistics command and say, please gather statistics on the joint distribution of those columns. Um, and uh, then uh, you rerun analyze, it gathers additional statistics on the joint distribution and things get better, usually. Um, there's probably data sets where the additional statistics that it gathered are not fine grained, grained enough to resolve all the issues, but I think results have been pretty good from what I've heard. Um, unfortunately, as soon as you make things a little bit more complicated, we're back in trouble. So the third example on this slide here involves a join and now we've got two possibly correlated columns, but they're in different tables. And Create Statistics isn't yet smart enough to deal with that case. So you're out of luck. Uh, you may be way off. Um, 
so to be clear, when we say smart enough, meaning you simply the you don't support correlated statistics across tables. Correct. Yeah, okay. So com commercial systems can do that. Postgres cannot. Okay. That, 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 I guess that was yeah. That was a statement. Sorry, not a question. Yes. You're like yeah. I think. Oh, yeah, that's, that's fine. I like I said, I, I don't actually know what other systems can do, but we can't, and that's okay. bad. Yeah, and I actually curious, yes, so like if uh, we'll, we'll get to him in a second. But like, what is what is the overhead for when for you run analyze if you add correlated statistics? Uh, I don't think it's very much, although I haven't checked it. I think most of the expense is having to read the table pages and okay. what you compute after that. I don't think is the big problem. Yeah, okay, all right. Habib, go for it. Yeah, so for your example number three, uh, which is a very important one, right, because it happens a lot because of the chain of the joins and you have predicates on two ends. So one solution over there is actually run a sample query. It doesn't take that long to do it and you will see the correlation. Uh, well, I mean, it... it it, it takes a long time to run the query unless you plan that query using accurate statistics. No, because what happens over here is that when you sample the query, you can actually have other predicates in there, such as UDFs, which you have no idea what the hell they are doing. But you will see the correlation. You will see the effect of UDFs. So, uh, and it doesn't take that long. People server does something similar like this as well, where they maintain uh, I think a little small sample of the tables and they can, you, in order to derive the statistics mm -hmm. of the correlation, you run on the, on the table. I should say also- Or, or, or just to run, run the sample on a real life table. Sure, yes. And meet also- Your efficient the basic group at IBM, so. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I mean, we do that. We do have this. Too. Yeah, because yes. our sampling, there are two ways, you know, Bernoulli, but we also have table page sampling. So we skip over pages. So if I do one in 10,000, it runs 10,000 times fast. Mm, I say, yeah. I mean, we have a table sample facility, but it's just like a user level facility. We don't use it for anything involving gathering of Yeah, that, that, that wouldn't cut it because it will also visit every row and then flip a coin. You've got to skip pages. What we, then we it have, is proportional. We, we have the ability to skip pages and pick a random subset of pages, but it's not, it's not, wired into the statistics framework. Yeah, but you know, SQL standard supports that, right? You know, you put from table X, table sample, and then you specify your rate. Yes. You know, either we, Bernoulli or you do system. That's, we yes. put that in the... <laughs> that, that's what I'm telling you we have. We, we have. You have, okay, that's good. Then use it. <laughs> well, that's the, the, the using it is the part that we don't do, but what we, we uh. do have. <laughs> You don't use okay. that for this. It's just for users to use, which uh, you're pointing out that that's not great. And you're right. right um, I want to yeah. talk, talk one, about one more bad case. Uh, th this is easily not, not even close. Th th this is easily the most annoying optimizer fail in, in, in PostgreSQL. Uh, the general shape of the query is select star from foo, where A equals one, order by B, limit one. And the problem here, as uh, I think many of you will uh, immediately grasp, is that we need to decide whether to scan an index on A or whether to scan an index on B. And one of those is likely to be really good and one of those is likely to be really bad. Um, if we scan an index on A, then we need to visit as many rows as there are that have A equals one and just keep whichever one of those has the lowest value of B. So if there's not very many such rows, this plan is really good. And if there's a ton of those rows, this plan is really bad. Uh, the other possibility is that we could scan an index on B uh, and just stop as soon as we find a row where A equals one, in which case things are gonna be great if we find one quickly and terrible if we go a long time without finding one. So, you know, to see the problem, uh, imagine that 10% of the rows in the table have A equals one. The planner may say, ah, well, this is good. And let's say that's a big, let's say 10% of the rows in the table is a big number. So the planner is gonna say, ah, well, if I just scan the index on B 
I will, on average, only have to scan about 10 rows before I find one where A equals one. So that looks pretty good comparing to go through going through 10% of the table. But in the worst case, it's actually far worse. You end up scanning 90% of the table because it can happen that all of the rows where A equals one have very large values in column B. And so you just scan through the other 90% of the table and then all the rows you actually want are clustered at the end of the index and you don't find one for a long time. Or it, maybe there's, you know, maybe you think there's a lot of rows where A equals one uh, and there actually aren't any for some reason. I mean, that shouldn't really happen if your statistics are up to date and the example is, is this simple, but, you know, sometimes we can get things wrong there too. So um, yeah, this is a hugely annoying problem. Generally the planner goes wrong by picking the, the index on B when it should pick the index on A. Um, and the best advice that I've been able to come up with in, you know, probably pushing 20 years of playing around with Postgres is to suggest to people that maybe the index on B should be dropped, which, you know, is a fairly blunt force instrument and often works because people often create more indexes than they really need. Um, but clearly if they'd needed that index for something else, then that strategy is not going to help. Um, this comes up so, a lot. It's so I was, I, I was gonna say this question to the end, but I think this is clearly the right time for this. Why no hints in Postgres? Like why, what is the design philosophy? It's clearly like this problem would be solved by hints. It's, it's, it's nice to have it all be automatic, but in this case, it would save people a lot of headache. Yeah, I mean, reason uh, for not having them. I mean, my sort of, you know, advanced server is an ADB fork of Postgres and it has hints. And, and I don't think I've ever told a customer to use them because they're not, they don't solve the problem, right? Like the problem that I, I mean, they might in this particular case actually, but in general, the, the issue with hints is that typically what a hint does is it basically says, use this exact query plan. And whether you think that makes sense or not, you're kind of forced into specifying the whole plan for the entire query. Because once you start, right, you're like, I know you think it's a bad idea to use a nested loop to join these two tables, but I say do it anyway. Well, you force that to be a nested loop, but all of the other decisions the planner is still making in other parts of the query tree are still wrong because the, the, the root of the problem is the row count estimates are wrong. And because the row count estimates are wrong, everything's wrong. So you, you can't really fix it by, by, by hinting a little bit of it. You got to hint the entire thing, right? You have to basically fully specify the, 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 the query plan. So if I had uh, my way, uh, the, the hint would say, hey, you're wrong about the row count estimate. And it would give me a way to, to fix that. And if I could tell a customer to put that thing in, into their query to fix the problem, or better yet, if I could do it declaratively with something like create statistics, that'd be awesome, right? But just having a way to force one particular part of the, the query to do a certain thing, even though it doesn't seem to make sense, is generally not great. Now, this case might be an exception because in this particular case, there's only sort of two possibilities. And because this is being planned as a subquery, it's not going to have the same kind of cascading ramifications uh, on the on the rest of the, the the query plan. So in this particular case, yeah, a hint might be a hint might be golden. Um, That's fair. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so last last real slide. Um, I, I'd sort of like you to take away three points from this discussion of statistics. Uh, the first one is that. The system actually works surprisingly well for how dumb it is. Uh, I was astonished the first time I discovered that A plus zero equals A could not be estimated remotely correctly. Um, and then I realized that I'd been running queries against Postgres for years and many, most of them had been uh, working just fine despite it being that easy to fool the darn thing. Um, and I, I think that's a pretty general experience. Most queries run okay for most users most of the time. Um, but despite that, people are constantly running into problems and some of them just don't have reasonable workarounds. You end up saying to people, you know, have you thought about redesigning your entire schema? And they're like, 
no, but I've thought about using a different database product that will work with the schema that I've got, or at least some of them say that, right? Which is not, not very satisfying. Um, and then the third uh, sort of takeaway that I'd like you to have is uh, that create statistics is pretty good stuff um, and, it, and it does help a lot. Uh, and I think it serves some of the function that you might hope to get out of a hint system, uh, but without requiring that you decorate every individual query, because that's another problem with hints. Once you, once you start using in query hinting as a way of solving problems, you're gonna, you, every query that has the problem has to be hinted. Whereas if you can somehow make create statistics able to deal with the problem, then you, you do it at the DBA level and you fix it once. And then all the queries that everybody runs uh, just work properly after that, which is, which is nice. And those queries will probably also adjust to changes in the data, uh, which also won't happen if you try to nail down the plan to be a, a certain particular thing. Um, not trying to be too hard on hints. I'm actually more receptive to the idea of hints than uh, at least one member of the PostgreSQL community. But uh, uh, um, they, they, it's not, I think it's not a problem free approach, even though it could be good in some cases. I, there's also like other engineering aspects, like they're sticky. So, like you upgrade to a new version, and maybe the problem you're trying to overcome with hints is solved, but like you're still, like no one's going to go back and fix your application. Yeah, I mean, that's another pitfall of that approach. Um, so we, I